Hello and welcome to our virtual monthly meeting on all things celiac. Today's webinar is Elite and Everyday Athletes with Celiac Disease, Eating for Fitness at All Ages, hosted by the National Celiac Association and the Celiac Research Program at Harvard Medical School. I'm Lee Graham, Executive Director of the National Celiac Association, serving the gluten-free community since 1993. NCA provides educational resources on our website, like Ask the Dietitian, Raising Our Celiac Kids, and Supporting Celiac Seniors. And Zoom support meetings are open to all on the second Tuesday of every month. And my thanks to all of you who have supported our food insecurity initiative, Feeding Gluten-Free. Together, we have given over a million dollars worth of gluten-free food to food pantries across the United States. For today, you are welcome to ask general questions through the Q&A feature, which is located on the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. Closed caption is available by clicking on the CC button. For those of you who have registered for continuing education units, please fill out the survey that will be added to the chat box during the webinar. If you're still struggling to connect with us, tech support is available if needed at Digital media at partners.org or by phone 857-282-6470. Also, this session is being recorded and will be available for viewing on NCA's website, nationalceliac.org. I'm honored to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Samuel Frank. Dr. Frank is director of the Huntington's Disease Society of America Center for Excellence at the Beth Israel Deaklis Medical Center and Associate Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. He completed his fellowship in experimental therapeutics with a focus on movement disorders. Dr. Frank directs research and leads clinical trials as part of Beth Israel Deaconess's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center. His goal is to develop treatments to improve the lives of patients with Parkinson's disease by improving symptoms and treating the underlying disease of gluten-related disorders. He recently joined the Celiac Center team at Beth Israel Deaconess to bring his expertise to patients with celiac disease who struggle with ataxia, a coordination problem, migraines and nerve damage neuropathy and other related symptoms. Dr. Frank has two daughters and many other family members with celiac disease. Welcome, Dr. Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be the moderator for this session today. Uh, our session is Elite and Everyday Athletes with Celiac Disease, Eating for Fitness at All Ages. And again, just a reminder that this session is being recorded and will be available later for viewing on the NCA website, uh, as well as the Harvard Medical School Celiac Research Program websites. Um, uh, and also as a reminder that CEUs are available and CMEs are available for registered dietitians, nurses, physicians, and social workers who have pre-registered uh, for the webinar. So please be sure to fill out the survey that's gonna be posted in the chat. Next, it's my pleasure not to delay this anymore and to introduce our first speaker. Um, Tara McCarthy it received her undergraduate degree in nutrition from James Madison University and her master of science degree in nutrition from Boston University. She's a, right, a registered dietitian since 1999 and has provided clinical services in pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital for the last 19 years. She's currently a clinical nutrition supervisor and she specializes in the treatment of children who uh, have to eliminate foods from their diet for different reasons, including celiac disease, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, eosinophilic esophagitis, and food allergies and intolerances. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me here at this great event. Share my screen. So we're gonna to talk today about bone health and physical activity in celiac disease. I have no disclosures for this presentation and just to let you know, I am at work and so you can see my background um, is a pediatric office. 
So the objectives of my talk today are to introduce primary nutrition concerns for individuals with celiac disease and bone health, identify challenges in meeting calcium and vitamin D needs and need for supplementation, and to offer practical strategies for meeting these nutrient needs. When we look at bone health before diagnosis, we may see people with repeat injuries. Um, some may have been told that they have lone bone density, and really the diagnosis of celiac disease may come after fractures. Some people have perceived a low bone density and some people have not before. But low, low bone density is common in both adults and children with untreated celiac disease and newly diagnosed celiac disease. And I really highlighted that untreated celiac disease because hopefully we will see lots of these things be better once we treat the celiac disease. So if we think about this, the bone health from diagnosis, pre-diagnosis, and then on the gluten-free diet, they look very different. For pre-diagnosis, we may see malabsorption, we may see a poor diet um, for lots of different reasons, whether you're not feeling well, whether there are symptoms, whether you're not able to absorb nutrients, there may be some metabolic bone disease, osteopenia, or osteoporosis. Once given the diagnosis of celiac disease and starting on the gluten-free diet, what we think about for bone health is really meeting your calcium and vitamin D needs, as well as remaining on a gluten-free diet. So these are the big takeaway messages is that we want to remain on a strict gluten-free diet. Why this is so important is because we know we want our VLI to be healthy so that we are able to absorb all of the nutrients that we take in in our diet every day. It's also important to have regular check-ins with your GI as well as your dietitian. And I kind of starred this one because I think this is really important. I think for lots of people, once they start uh, the gluten-free diet and they're feeling better, they kind of think they don't have to go back and check in. And it's really important to highlight the um, going back to see your physician as well as the dietitian um, so that we can look uh, at every level of your diet and make sure that you're meeting all of your needs. Calcium intake is one important piece. We want you to meet the dietary reference intake, and I'll show you what those numbers are for each individual. Um, we also want to make sure that you're meeting your vitamin D intake. Um, so we want to also sometimes have uh, levels checked um, at your yearly appointments. So this is a table I use a lot to um, help people understand how much calcium and vitamin D they need to get in their diet, how much is recommended. Why, why I have it all the way from one until 70 is because I am a pediatric dietitian. So um, the levels for a lot of my patients are changing as they grow. And so you can see that from a one to three year old might only need 700 milligrams, but then a teenager is going to need closer, going to need 1300 milligrams. That continues on until about 50, 51 to 70, it decreases a little bit for males and females, and then stays about 1200 milligrams per day. The vitamin D dose intake uh, should be about 600 IUs, um, but most, my, most multivitamins, especially we want them to be gluten-free, will have at least 600 IUs of vitamin D in them daily. When we first think about how do we meet our calcium needs, we want to think about all the calcium containing foods that we have. So we have our dairy, which would include milk and yogurt and cheese. We have vegetables, lots of thinking about green vegetables, so spinach, kale, and bok choy, as well as fortified foods. So that might be fruit juices that are fortified with calcium, tofu that might be fortified with calcium, and ready to eat gluten free cereals that are also fortified. So who in the um, who in my world am I worried about most um, for their calcium and their vitamin D? So for calcium, I'm worried about people who are avoiding dairy. This could be someone who is a vegan. This could be someone who has food allergies. This could be someone who has IBS or even just selective eaters who maybe have dropped off of dairy. I'm also worried about the people who are still symptomatic. If you're still symptomatic, we worry that maybe you're not able to eat all the things that you need to do. We also worry that um, you're not picking maybe the foods that are gonna be the best because you're just getting through the symptoms. You may have be eating less than you are because you're still feeling bad, or you might actually um, not be able to absorb some of the nutrients. And then I'm worrying about anyone who is consuming gluten um, regularly, who also we know would not be able to absorb all of their nutrients because of the inflammation. So one of the first groups I mentioned was the people who are avoiding dairy completely, whether it be for um, someone who might be a vegan or someone might be um, doing it for an allergy. Um, this is a big part of our diet to provide calcium. 
So there are lots of milk substitutes, especially in the pediatric world. Um, it's also a significant amount of um, calories. And so I really um, strongly encourage my patients to take in milk substitutes. But there are lots of different milk substitutes out there. We have the pea protein milk, we have the flax protein plus, um, uh, oat milk, uh, rice milk, and all of them we would like to be labeled gluten-free, but you can see that the differences um, are significant. So for some of the milks, you might only get 20 milligrams per cup of calcium, where some milks you might get 440 milligrams per, of calcium. So this is a really important table I use because I wanna see why are we using the milk substitute? If it's just because we like the taste of it and we don't have to worry about calcium or vitamin D, then you can pick any one of these milks if you're worried about protein as well as calcium. You wanna just make sure when you're reading the label of what you're really looking for in any of these substitutes. So how do you meet your calcium intake? So this is something I want you guys to kind of think about and question at the end of the day. Is it dairy? Is it non-dairy sources? Is it fortified foods, um, OJ with calcium? Is it just a pure calcium supplement or a combination of the above? And what I would say is that majority are probably the combination of above and it's okay to get it from multiple places that it doesn't only have to be for one. We also don't want people to eat just to get nutrients. We want people to eat to enjoy um, and also be safe and get their nutrients. So it might be a combination of all of these things. So moving on to vitamin D, vitamin D is a nutrient we eat and a hormone our bodies make. It helps our bodies to absorb and retain the calcium and phosphorus, which is very important for building bone. And according to the NHANES data, the national prevalence of vitamin D deficiency was about 29%, which is very significant. So when we think about this, we wanna talk about what are the food and supplementation to meet our vitamin D needs. So there are very few natural foods that contain vitamin D. We have fatty fish such as salmon or swordfish or tuna, fish liver oils, small amounts in egg yolks, cheese and beef liver and some mushrooms. There's a larger amount in fortified gluten-free cereals. And then dairy and some plant-based products, as you saw from my last slides, are fortified with vitamin D, but only about 120 IUs per cup. So again, you need to have a significant amount in order to meet your vitamin D. There is also orange juice that is fortified from D, uh, by, fortified with vitamin D. And of course, we all know it's also uh, nicknamed the sunshine vitamin, which is where we would get our vitamin D as well. So for this group, for vitamin D, who am I worried about for this group? The people I'm worried about, again, are the people who are avoiding dairy um, or other foods. Um, so that makes their um, ability to get in the, the foods that have vitamin D less. People who are still symptomatic, same reason, if they're symptomatic, their diet might change, they might eat less, they might not be able to absorb everything that they are taking in. People who are still consuming gluten, so again, if their VLI is damaged. People who live in places where we hardly see the sun, so I can say that from a person living in the Northeast, um, we have a very small window of the sun, and then when it is extremely um, hot out, when we would get the most vitamin D, we're always wearing sunscreen. And then people with darker skin who is almost um, comes across as sunscreen because it will block that vitamin D from coming in. So this is the groups that I would worry about that even just getting it in through food might be difficult and may need some supplementation. So first, we always want to do food first to meet our needs and then supplements second. We also want to try to include a variety of gluten-free foods to meet your nutrient needs. This is really important and you can all take a look at your own diet and just as I'm talking and think about it, if you're eating the same exact breakfast every single day, you're only going to get those vitamins and minerals that are in those foods every single day. Where if you have a variety, you're going to get different amounts um, each day from the different foods. So variety is really important. Um, what I tell a lot of the kids that I counsel, I say, if you eat it yesterday, you shouldn't eat it today. So at least that gets us in a two-day rotation, especially if we have some selective eaters. So I talk a lot about food rotation and mixing up your meals and snacks and just making sure that you're getting that variety in to get the most bang for your buck. Um, supplements should always be labeled gluten-free, um, but many people do need to take an additional supplement if they can't get it in their food. So I just wanted to look at a, a day of an age, uh, a person who's aged maybe 14 to 100, um, their calcium needs uh, and their vitamin D needs, about 1300 and 600 to 800. I have a really uh, large range there from 14 to 100. And so I had to kind of stretch out the numbers. Um, but if you look at this diet, it seems like a pretty healthy, uh, good day. So for breakfast, some gluten-free oatmeal with a quarter cup of milk and two tablespoons of walnuts for a snack. There might be eight ounces of yogurt with some grapes. 
Um, for lunch, a turkey sandwich on gluten-free bread, for snack, carrots and hummus, for dinner, salmon, quinoa and Brussels sprouts. But you can see at the end of the day, this person is only getting 510 milligrams of calcium and less than 600 I use of vitamin D. If I didn't have salmon on that day and instead I had chicken, that actually vitamin D goes down to only 34 I use. So again, this is a really healthy looking diet, but we're not able to meet the calcium and vitamin D. So how do we change that? How do we, what do we do if we eat something different on the next day? So this is a different sample. For breakfast, they had a fortified gluten-free rice cereal and a whole cup of milk. Um, for the snack, it was that same exact snack. For lunch, we changed it to beans and rice and we added a chocolate soy milk, which added that 300 milligrams of calcium. For snack, a gluten-free popcorn snack and an apple. And then for dinner, this was a gluten-free pizza and a salad. So this was really close to meeting at the, the 1275 milligrams of calcium and about 200 IUs of vitamin D. So I ask everyone to really look at what does your typical day look like? Maybe you should keep a three-day food record and kind of look at the average intake. A dietitian as well can help you with this, but really looking over several days, how are you doing with your calcium and your vitamin D intake and seeing where you're missing and seeing maybe where we can substitute some other foods that might have a higher amount of calcium and vitamin D, as well as do we need a supplement and if so, how much? So the takeaway message here are to continue on a strict gluten-free diet. We know that we want our VLI to be as healthy as possible so that we can absorb all the nutrients that we are eating. Ensure that you're meeting calcium and vitamin D through food and or supplementation. So really taking a strong look at your own diet as well as getting help from a dietitian. And then follow up with your GI and RD to monitor complications of celiac disease as well as the gluten-free diet and how it can be restrictive. This is my favorite slide to end any talk that I do. Um, on the left are my three young children. As I was um, doing a race, they had this sign that said, keep going, mommy. And I use this on almost every single talk because I think we all need some encouragement that this is hard work. We know that you're doing a lot um, to be gluten-free. And so we wanna give you some encouragement to keep going and to always, I say, push nutrition to the top um, to make sure that we're meeting all of our needs. And these are my grown up children now. And I thought it was very fitting for this talk on um, athletes. I have a, a young track star, a, a tennis player and a baseball player that I'm sure every day as they grow and change that their diet and their needs grow and change, which is why we need to constantly relook at what we're doing. Thank you again. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Tara. And uh, thank you for mentioning questions. There are some that are coming in, so please keep them in. I think that what we're going to do is have all the presentations and then get to the questions at the end, if that's all right. But there are definitely some specific questions for you that, that, that we will get to. Um, great. Um, so our next speaker is Mary Ellen Kelly. And she is a former Division I track and field collegiate athlete. Uh, she's a registered dietitian and board certified sports dietitian. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition from Boston University and a Master's degree in Clinical Nutrition from New York University. Mary Ellen completed her clinical training at the James J. Peters Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. Her previous professional journey includes working as a full-time team dietitian for the Miami Dolphins of the National Football League, the head sports nutritionist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and campus dietitian sports nutritionist at St. John's University in Queens, New York. She's currently the owner of Fuel Forward, a private practice and sports nutrition um, consulting business, and we look forward to her talk, Elite and Everyday Athletes with Celiac Disease. Mary, Mary Ellen, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, and Tara, thank you so much for your very informative presentation. Um, so as it was said, I'll be speaking about elite and everyday athletes with celiac disease. So this really is an inside look at fueling considerations with um, practical strategies um, for everyone who's trying to fuel what, um, whatever they're trying to do athletically. Um, let's see. So just one disclosure, I am the owner of um, my private practice and consulting company, Fuel Forward LLC. Um, so our objectives today, I am going to introduce the primary nutrition related considerations for athletes and active individuals, and then identify challenges that may arise for athletes and active individuals with celiac disease. 
Finally, I will be offering practical fueling strategies for athletes and active individuals who are following the gluten-free diet. Um, this is just a quote. I'm not going to read it, but this is an elite level athlete that I had the pleasure of working with. And I asked him if he would be willing to just sort of share his experience with all of you. Um, as you can see here, he had five years in the National Football League with a celiac diagnosis um, and, and really did incredible work. Um, and so you can see that he found the attention to detail um, with everything else was not a problem. But when he really dialed in his nutrition and his gluten free diet, he absolutely found um, there were amazing benefits to the way he felt and the way that he was able to perform at a really high level. So I'm proud of him and wanted to share his story to kick us off. So I always say that athletes are individuals. Um, quite often folks are looking for sort of a one size fits all recommendation or, you know, what do athletes eat or if people are active, what should they be consuming? Um, but we know that there is so much to take into consideration and to understand. So identifying what sport they are trying to um, participate in and then within the sport, their position or their event or their weight class um, their, you know, level of competition. So is it elite level performance or is it more recreational training days versus competition days can look different. And then of course the goals that they're working on. And then also it's understanding the periodization of their year. So no one should be training at the highest level 365 days a year. Um, and that's why it's beautiful that there are built in season and off season um, and post season would be considered sort of a championship time um, for a team if they're making it into their, their post season. So all of that is taken into consideration when we're working with athletes. Um, so whenever I am in a uh, group and we're talking in a setting that we're really engaged, I, I put up this goals title and I just ask what, what could the goals be when it comes to nutrition? What could nutrition do for us? Um, and hopefully audiences understand that nutrition can do a lot of things. So increasing energy levels, I always say I've never met an athlete that isn't looking for more energy at some point in their career, um, decreasing muscle soreness. So it sort of comes with the territory, but how we fuel our body can definitely work to minimize that muscle soreness, promoting faster recovery so, and healing. So again, that's sort of that chronic soreness or any sort of wear and tear that's chronic, but also acute injury as well optimize body composition, and then improve immunity and overall health. Um, a lot of times, I think outside looking in, folks start to think that, you know, what are the biggest challenges we see with athletes and active individuals? And, and I think there's a lot of different hypotheses. People think, you know, maybe they're sort of eating too much junk food, or maybe they're eating too restrictive, or maybe there's something in between. And the overarching theme that um, I see and many of my peers and colleagues in this space see um, is actually inadequacy. So more and more, um, a lot of things are influencing inadequacy, inadequacy in athletes and active individuals. So I've created this pyramid that I use to work with the athletes that I can um, consult with, really starting at the foundation of are they adequately meeting their needs for what they're asking their body to do. And once we establish adequacy, we work into balance and balancing out their meals and their snacks and making sure that there is great variety there. And then can they do it consistently? So a lot of times there's sort of a full force effort as they start off. And then, you know, how can they, how can these efforts be realistic and sustainable so that they can be consistent with their efforts? And then the final two pieces of this pyramid, so A, B, C, D, and E, are the details, um, and that really focuses on a concept of nutrient timing, which I'll get into a little bit later on, and it's, it's sort of the bookend of when they train. And then the very last piece of this pyramid, as you can see here, is ergogenic aids, um, otherwise known as dietary supplements. And quite often, folks think that's actually the starting point. A lot of times, that's what brings people in is because of their questions on dietary supplements. But I'm quick to remind folks that if we're not building the foundation of this pyramid, then we're sort of just spending money to supplement a poor diet and we're never going to get the outcomes that we're looking for. So this is kind of the way I work through sports nutrition for most athletes and active individuals. So a little more on adequacy here. Um, a lot of times there's a, there's a lot of barriers to make that happen. So if I'm working with high school or college student athletes or even folks that are into their professional career, time, 
money, convenience, knowledge, or mindfulness. So have they made the mental switch to recognize that fueling their body is another piece to the puzzle in whatever their endeavors are and whatever they're trying to do. Um, So I always kind of throw this fancy car in here. I recently learned it's a Porsche. Um, So this, I always say, if this was your car, how would you choose choose to fuel this high performance vehicle? And I challenge my clients to honor their body and take really good care of it in the same way that they, they would take really good care of this car. So again, I say, if I was driving into work and this was your car, I probably wouldn't see it stalled out on the side of the road because you forgot to take good care of it. And so in honoring our body, it's recognizing that taking care of nutrient timing and fueling our body regularly throughout the day is going to be really important. So here's a piece on adequacy. I remember when I was a college student athlete, um, sort of the overarching theme that we were all educated on was this red triangle that you can see. And this was called the female athlete triad. And this was definitely the predominant um, piece of education that female athletes were getting. Um, And what you're looking at in this wheel, um, which I did not create, I'll give credit. um, There's a paper in my final references um, from the 2014 position paper from the International Olympic Committee. They've created these diagrams. Um, Relative energy deficiency in sport. So folks who are functioning at a high level in an energy deficit This can lead to menstrual dysfunction and can lead to poor bone health. So how this was showing up in female athletes was stress fractures. And we were realizing that the either lack of menstruation or irregular menstruation, um, the tie of bone health to our estrogen levels was very clear. But in 2014, um, these governing bodies started to really figure out that there's a lot more to it than that little triangle. And they expanded this entire wheel to show that relative energy deficiency in sport affects so many other things beyond menstrual cycle and bone health. And it starts to affect um, our endocrine system, our metabolic system, our hematological system, and you can go around the wheel and gastrointestinal system. So we're starting to see that when folks are functioning at a high level, a lot of things can be impacted by it. But obviously this wheel is sort of hard to follow for some patients. So they did create this other one that shows how it shows up for us. So what does that actually mean? So it's showing up in all of these different symptoms as irritability and depression and decreased glycogen stores, which is that's the carbohydrate storage in our muscles. So showing up with decreased muscle strength, endurance performance, increased risk of injury, decreased um, training response and everything around this wheel. So I I love these diagrams from this paper. Um, This is just a piece that I've created for athletes that I've worked with to really kind of bring it to life for them and let them see this is how relative energy deficiency in sport is showing up. So to be clear, relative energy deficiency in sport is not an eating disorder. It may be. Someone with an eating disorder may be in an energy deficit, but it may also be due to time restrictions or dietary limitations and restrictions. So you can see how this can start to overlap. If an individual is choosing or needing to engage in a gluten-free diet, if they're not following appropriate substitutions to meet their needs, they can find themselves eliminating gluten, finding themselves in a large energy deficit because they're not finding adequate replacement. And now we find this entire um, series of events that happens in relative energy deficiency in sport. So moving um, beyond that piece, um, when I'm educating athletes, you know, uh, my community is sports dietitians, and we talk quite a bit on how do we simplify this and how do we make this practical strategies for folks to figure out how to maximize their meals. Um, And there's sort of an overarching theme that exists in college and sports nutrition, which is build three-step meals. So these are the three steps. And if athletes and active individuals can sort of break down all the confusion and every time they build a plate, build a balanced plate with fruits and vegetables and healthy fats, carbs, and protein, they're going to check a lot of boxes. So this slide is going to get a little bit busy, but it gives you all the information that you probably need or a lot of information on how to build balanced plates. So right here, we have the why. Why do we need these three things on our plates? And then how do we do this effectively? So we have in here this column of top picks. 
And then we have this column in here of limit. I'm very deliberate with my language. You'll never hear me say avoid because I don't believe folks need to avoid these foods. Unless, of course, you know, we are following the gluten-free diet and those are gluten containing. So right here, I'm going to circle the carbs. We really just want to pay attention to in our top picks column, we're paying attention to these carbohydrate sources, not just eliminating gluten-free carbohydrate, but replacing them to meet our needs with the things listed here in this table. And so it's creating those three-step meals that creates balance so that we don't run into a, either a total energy def deficiency or starting to go lower on micronutrients. So those are our vitamins and minerals. This is just a really nice visual that I won't take credit for. This comes from the U.S. Olympic Training Center. Um, so they use this with the Olympic athletes. And again, this has been sort of borrowed and used throughout the country with college and pro athletes, showing how to build a balanced plate. So these plates are not clearly not gluten-free. So we would have to take the time to say gluten-free pasta um, or making sure it's rice or potatoes, but still the framework is the same, helping individuals build their balanced plate um, you'll see the carbohydrate or the grain piece starts to grow bigger as we are increasing from a light day to a moderate day to a hard day. Right here is just sort of an example of, of ways I've educated athletes on how to build those plates. So you're looking at carbs paired with protein, paired with fruits and vegetables, rather than just saying, I'm just going to have a bar for breakfast or, you know, I'm in such a rush, I'm just going to have um, I don't know, cereal for dinner in the dining hall for my college student athletes, but really taking a step back in that carbohydrate column, making sure that those are gluten-free granola, gluten-free bread, um, gluten-free tortillas, brown rice or, or white rice, um, rice noodles, choosing those gluten-free carbohydrates, pairing them with high quality proteins and with fruits and vegetables, which sometimes tend to be either missing or lower in quantity for some of our athletes. Moving into the details, which I mentioned in the pyramid, this is the bookending technique. So this is where nutrition for athletes and active individuals gets to be um, sort of more specific. So we're looking at the balance of our meals, and then we're looking at how we bookend our workouts. So the recommendation is to get a quick fuel source prior, and then actually something post. It's an emphasis on carbohydrates coming into training, and then it's an emphasis on carbs paired with protein post-training. Chocolate milk has gotten excellent support for recovery, but we know many folks might be avoiding um, lactose, so maybe they would do a chocolate soy milk. Also excellent for recovery in that window just after hard training, and then following up with a balanced meal about within two hours after that. Um, these are just some examples of some pre and post practice snacks that you have here. So fruit, great carbohydrate or trail mix, carbs paired with a little bit of protein and healthy fat. There's gluten-free cereal, gluten-free bars. I'm sure this audience has a long list of favorites that they enjoy. Gluten-free pretzels, gluten-free toast with peanut butter, gluten-free waffles or overnight gluten-free oats are just a few. And again, I'm sure this audience could add to this list. Um, some important nutrients, and I won't spend too much time here because Tara um, spent some time going over them as well, but things that we would just be paying attention to. So uh, if you take a step back and sort of look at this from a bird's eye view, this is a balanced diet. This is really taking some time to choose lean proteins, um, plenty of color, fruits and vegetables, getting those fortified foods in where you need them to try to make sure that we're meeting our needs of these micronutrients. Um, so we've wrapped up on food and we'll head into hydration and then wrap up with dietary supplements. Um, so people always ask about hydration and, and what is the best hydrator? It is water. Um, so it doesn't always excite people, but that is the answer. Water is absolutely our best hydrator. And I've put here on the left, the Institute of Medicine's fluid recommendations so the ranges are really big and they're going to vary quite a bit based on individual exercise. I just encourage folks to sort of pay attention to themselves, kind of follow yourself around for a day, see what your urine color looks like. It should look like lemonade. It shouldn't look like apple juice um, and work somewhere around these numbers to pay attention to your fluid and take throughout the day. The question always comes up about sports beverages. My answer is this. Sports beverages are made for sport. And so if you are exercising longer than an hour or you're in hotter weather, you definitely could benefit from a sports beverage, whether it's a homemade sports beverage or a commercially prepared product. And the emphasis, surprisingly for many folks, is actually sugar and salt. 
So physiologically, what our body is going to need as we extend into harder exercise, so over an hour or in hotter weathers, are those primary ingredients. If we're not doing that and we're a casual exerciser, or maybe we're an athlete, but we're not participating in sport at the time, we do not need sports beverages. So kind of running theme is sports beverages are made for sport and may be appropriate in those settings. Um, and then post-exercise, they may find their way in because um, they do provide fluid electrolytes and carbs, but you might want to pair it with a bar or a turkey sandwich or something to get that protein and gluten-free bread. <laughs> Um, one last thing is runner's diarrhea because it comes up quite a bit is that we do see the causes of this can be a decreased blood flow to the GI tract, changes in hormone secretions, tolerance of certain foods, and then actually pre-race anxiety, stress, and nerves comes up quite a bit for runner's diarrhea. So there are some non-nutritional considerations such as intensity of the run type, um, fitting clothing and, and, and then your fueling strategies, which are listed here. So I have a long list here that folks can pay attention to on their own, looking at, you know, nothing new on race day. Don't just try something you've never tried on a competition day. Paying attention to the timing of when you fuel your hydration, really lowering or limiting that fiber content, limiting or avoiding caffeine if you know that that's going to throw off your GI tract pre-exercise. Sugar alcohols can get some folks in trouble and actually non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as well. So some things to limit or take away. I'll wrap up with just my recommendation on dietary supplements. Of course, anything you want to take should be gluten-free. But beyond that, um, dietary supplements are not tightly regulated. So if there are any drug-tested athletes in the room or folks that may find themselves at the collegiate level or a level that gets drug-tested, in the sports nutrition space, we highly recommend that any products are third-party tested, specifically with this NSF logo. So you'd be looking for that to really guarantee the purity of your dietary supplements. I'll leave you with this performance nutrition checklist that I won't go over, but it's a great way to kind of take some time and see, are you doing all of these things to maximize your performance by the way that you fuel your body? I just thank you. And here's just a few references for you. Great. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, another great presentation. Um, again, questions are coming in. Thank you so much for submitting them. I think that we are uh, a little ahead of time. So I think that we will um, uh, be able to get to all of your questions, but please keep them rolling in. Um, and uh, with that, I think that we are going to turn to our third presenter, Caroline Johnson. And Caroline Johnson is a Division I cross-country and track athlete from Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania, who's living with celiac disease. She's been running competitively since the age of 10 and was diagnosed with celiac disease when she was 14. Caroline is on the board of Celiac Kids Connection, which is a family and community support group administered through the Celiac Program at Boston Children's Hospital. She also writes a recipe column for the group's newsletter and runs cooking demos for her kids. So I know my own family has seen that column and, and follows it. Caroline loves to cook and is studying biology on a pre-med track in hopes of becoming a gastroenterologist to help others with celiac disease and GI issues. And let me also say that you can help celiac disease community without going into GI, but great for you to, to think about that. Uh, next is her talk on uh, being a college athlete with celiac disease. Caroline, you wanna share your screen? I'm Caroline, and this is my presentation on being a college athlete with celiac disease. And I have no disclosures for this presentation. So about me, I'm from Marblehead, Massachusetts. As he just said, I was diagnosed with celiac disease when I was 14, and my diet is also restricted by small intestine bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, which means I have to eat low FODMAP, and a peanut and tree nut allergies. I've been involved with Celiac Kids Connection for five years. I was a teen board member, and then when I graduated high school, I became a member at large. I write the recipe column and do cooking demonstrations, and I've been running since I was 10. I ran for four years at middle school and then in high school, and now I run in college at Lafayette College and I'm majoring in biology. Um, so these are just some examples of meals and snacks I use to fuel my day. Um, for breakfast, I usually would have 
either gluten-free quinoa flakes or oatmeal um, with sunflower butter and fruit. And then I also have smoothies a lot in the summer after my runs, fruit, eggs, or egg whites with toast, and then yogurt bowls topped with fruit and granola or a gluten-free cereal are also things I'd have. For lunch, um, when I'm not at school, I usually have salads. But this year at school, I had a lot of chicken, rice, and veggies almost every day because that's what was available in the dining hall. And I also, on my own, will love gluten-free pasta. Usually lunch is the last like bigger meal I have before um, practice in the afternoon. So I would usually like something like rice or pasta from this year because I want some carbs before running in the afternoon. For dinner, usually similar to lunch, chicken or fish with either squash, potatoes, or rice, and then a low FODMAP veggie. And for snacks of the day, my favorite snack is popcorn. I also will have protein bars and granola bars, gluten-free, of course. And then before I run, I usually like a bar or a banana with sunflower seed butter or frozen fruit or a gluten-free cereal. So um, meals with the team are a little more difficult. Throughout high school, we had a lot of team dinners and team breakfasts where someone's family would host it. And for that, I would usually bring my own food unless I knew the people really well. Like if it was one of my best friends hosting and they knew what I could and couldn't eat and that I couldn't be cross-contaminated, they would usually um, make something. But most of the time, I would bring my own food. And then taking meals on the road, some of the things I like to travel with are salads, sandwiches, and frittata because I generally, if I'm competing, I don't like to eat food from a restaurant or food that I didn't make, like from either dinner the night before or breakfast or lunch before because I just don't want to risk cross-contamination or accidentally eating gluten before a race. Um, so I generally will bring my own food. And then team provided meals is something that's come up more in college. And I think they've been really good about it. They usually check with me and there's another girl on my team with celiac disease. They tell us what our options are. Um, they always make sure there's a gluten-free option. So that's generally been good. And at banquets in high school, they were more potluck style. So that's always a good setup, I feel like, when you have celiac disease, because you could just sign up to make a gluten-free entree and bring a separate spoon and keep it like more on the side so that it doesn't touch the other food. And then at meats... Um, because sometimes track meets can be several hours. And if you're like doubling in a relay or in another event, you can be racing like three or four hours apart. So it meets I like to bring like sandwiches and granola bars and popcorn to have either before or after or in between events. And then getting diagnosed with celiac disease really improved my performance because I was feeling so sluggish and tired, and I was really underweight um, prior to getting diagnosed. So within my first year of diagnosis, I knocked almost three minutes off my 5K time and um, a little over 30 seconds off my mile within a year of being diagnosed. And then I had more energy. I was finally able to build a little bit of muscle, and I was beating people who previously were much faster than me before I got diagnosed and I was still eating gluten. And um, with running and celiac disease, I have had some stress fractures. I've had a stress fracture most recently this spring, and I've had two stress reactions. I've dealt with reds and amenorrhea um, and low iron and ferritin. But even with the challenges that come with being an athlete with celiac disease, you can still enjoy and excel in a sport and get a lot out of it, even with a restricted diet. And that is the end. Great. Thank you, Caroline.
Okay, we have a number of questions that were submitted in advance, and we've had a number of questions that have been submitted during. Um, so if I could have all the panelists um, uh, back on, that would be great. And uh, while, while you are, are all getting on and, and turning your mics on, I, let me start off with uh, the fact that I, I, I've kind of broken these up with some of the questions that are very specific for our talk and some of them that may overlap with more kind of general celiac questions. Um, so let's start off with the ones that, that are uh, mo pretty specific. And, and there are a few questions that have come up with themes. So, so Tara, let me start off with you um, with some of the questions that, that have been coming in. <clears throat> I'm really related to absorption and calcium D, calcium and vitamin D. Um, and so here's one of the questions what's the best time of day to take a calcium and vitamin D supplement? And are there any particular foods it should be taken with to help absorbency? So that's a great question. Um, my quick and dirty answer, I would say, is anytime you remember to take it daily. I think that's really important. Um, for some people, you know, you might need a reminder. For some people, it's the parent who's giving it to the child. For some people, you know, um, it has different, different kind of tricks. You know what I mean? Like put it with the coffee maker or whatever it is that makes you actually remember, because I think that's the most important piece. Um, the piece about absorption is that the one other piece we want is we want vitamin D along with that. And, and one thing I want to also mention on a little tangent on the vitamin D is that some of the numbers that I mentioned in my, um, in my uh, talk was the uh, dietary reference intake. However, um, we really highly suggest that everyone gets their vitamin D checked. If you have a low vitamin D, you're going to need much more vitamin D than the typical DRI. So you are going to need more. Um, so that would be something that the physician can help you along with to, to how much vitamin D you would get, but you're definitely going to be, need more than just the average every single day. So most important thing is to remember to take it. Um, I will say that um, our body absorbs about 500 milligrams of calcium at a time. And so if you are taking a thousand or more, you would split that up um, for better absorption. Um, so that's what I would recommend. So find out your number, put it in five, um, 500 milligram chunks of time and put it during the day at specific times every single day so that you actually remember it. Great. And just a couple questions along the vitamin D line uh, that, that have come in um, is uh, one is about really people who are who don't eat milk or dairy products. Um, and what are some suggestions to get calcium and vitamin D in, in those situations? Um, so people who are vegan, for example, um, or or vegetarian. Um, so that they what are some options uh, for, for people that have different types of dietary restrictions or preferences? I think for, for calcium, it's a little bit easier because there's a lot of products that are fortified. So a lot of the plant-based milks, as I mentioned, are gonna be fortified. So, so it's a little bit easier to get the calcium in from plant-based diet. Vitamin D is just not really readily available in many foods. It is in some small doses, um, but I really tell people to not really count on it. You want to encourage it and you want to have it in your diet, but I wouldn't try to necessarily meet my vitamin D, which is why I think getting the level tested is really important. If you're taking a multivitamin, then you're getting your regular everyday dose anyway. Um, but a lot of people do need to have supplementation for vitamin D. Okay, great. And then, um, Mary Ellen, I have a question for you or one that overlaps, but before we get there, Tara, I, I just, um, this is a question from me, not from the audience. You talked about some of the concerns that you had um, in, in sp specific situations, but particularly in, in athletics and certain sports, weight loss or weight gain can be a real concern and, and can be a sign of something or something that people strive for. Um, so can you talk about your concerns in terms of weight when it comes to athletics and celiac disease? Um, so I might have Mary Ellen ask, I'll, I'll say my piece, but then I'm going to have Mary Ellen. I thought it was, I thought it'd be a good transition question. Yes, that. exactly. Exactly. So I feel like in my clinic, um, I'm real, again, I'm, I'm pediatric based. So I'm constantly looking at weight and their growth to ensure that they're growing appropriately. Um, so for me, it's always a big um, red flag. If we see these switches of what has happened, what has happened to, to see the significant weight loss, what has happened to see that there is no weight gain or the reverse, what has happened to see this large weight gain. If, if, 
if that's the case. So I think any kind of switch is something that we have to kind of look at and dive a little bit deeper into that and see what was the change. Um, was it, you know, we see a lot of times that they were uh, undernourished, I'm going to say before diagnosis, um, and then they um, go gluten free and their body's able to absorb everything. Um, they're also feeling more hungry and things like that. And then I do warn everyone, you know, sometimes what we see is that um, people get so focused on gluten free diet that they focus on the words gluten free. And so they start buying a lot more processed products. And so one of my big real pictures right in the beginning is to kind of not go down that path of just eating things because it says gluten-free. Gluten-free does not necessarily mean a healthy, um, uh, you know, um, option. And so, you know, there's a difference between safety and, and healthy and, and looking overall. And in the beginning, if that's what gets you through some pieces, but the real goal is to eat whole natural foods that are gluten-free that aren't necessarily in a package that say gluten-free. So I know Mary Ellen really highlighted two of the fruits and the vegetables and the natural grains. You know, again, we, we stress a lot because we get on, um, stuck on potatoes, rice, and corn. And I think it's really important to look at the other natural uh, gluten-free grains and to really, so overall just monitoring the situation and why are we seeing these fluctuations? Great. Mary Ellen, any other comments on that? <clears throat> You know, I think um, Tara really answered it and covered it. I would echo really everything <laughs> that she just said. Um, but I completely agree with, you know, so, sort of the switch to, to the gluten-free bread, gluten-free pasta, all that stuff feels like a first step. And then over time, they can still have their place. But, you know, overall nutrient quality, um, kind of paying attention to some of the you know, the rices and different types of rice and quinoa and those types of, and potatoes and all that stuff um, to really round out the diet is super helpful. And then, and then of course, adequacy, you know, throughout they're all three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrate so that they are meeting their needs. Right. And Tara, um, there's some questions about how much calcium gets absorbed just before we get to some other questions to you, Miriam, but, but just to clarify that you said 500 milligrams gets absorbed at a time. Is that right? So if yes. people need more than that, then they should spread it out throughout the day. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mary Ellen and Caroline, don't worry. We have questions for you too. Uh, but Mary Ellen, there are a lot of questions around sports drinks and I would say kind of supplements. So um, the, the, one of the questions was any suggestions for, for gluten-free sports related drinks, gels, or other foods? And, and perhaps you can talk about how to best find um, the, the one that, that's right for that particular athlete. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought it up. I was reading them come through in the chat. So sports drinks are very controversial, I find. I find that folks see them as the same as soda um, or, you know, anything that is super high in sugar. And the truth is, if a sports beverage is being consumed not in the presence of sport, you are correct. You're, you're just drinking a sugar-sweetened beverage. But in sport, if an athlete is adequately fueled to start their physical activity, what that means is their muscles are saturated with glycogen. They're full and they're ready. And if we had a picture of them, they'd be red and vibrant and they'd be ready to go. And what happens in sport is it can only go down, right? So it starts to deplete. And the quickest way to get that back in, at halftime or at mile markers in a marathon or at any point where an athlete can refuel, the answer actually is sugar, which is really hard for people to hear because sugar gets demonized. But sports beverages are predominantly their their sugar sweetened beverages with salt in them. And again, in society, that, that doesn't make sense. But in sport, in higher level sport, when folks are, you know, and by higher level, I just mean someone is going for more than an hour or they're in the hot weather. As hard as it is for so folks to hear, that's actually what the body's going to use. So people are like, sports drinks are so high in sugar. They are. They're not appropriate if you're just playing video games at 10 o'clock at night. And if you're sweating, playing video games at 10 o'clock at night, you should probably talk to your doc, right? <laughs> But using it at halftime or fourth quarter or during a marathon makes perfect sense. So sports beverages are formulated in a way there's decades and decades of research behind them to support that actually that little bit of sugar and sodium is what is going to get the body back for fourth quarter focus or for end of marathon or end of or end of, you know, even a shorter race focus. So many people want to stay away from the commercialized beverages, and that's fine. You can absolutely make your own. I saw that question in the chat. 
So then the emphasis is going to be diluting um, a juice because a juice would be much higher in sugar and actually probably create some GI stuff even in the healthiest gut. So we want to be diluting juice and then actually adding salt to it. So there are some incredible recipes online um, that you can Google. The U.S. Olympic Training Center has some really good ones. Nancy Clark is an incredible Boston Day sports dietitian. She has a guidebook with a ton of different recipes. Um, but essentially what we're doing is diluting juice and then putting some salt in there if we're making our own. Otherwise, some of the more mainstream brands are, are actually really appropriate in sport, um, which again, I know that's challenging for some folks. So it doesn't have to be the mainstream beverages. It could, it could also be a homemade one that meets sodium and, and carbohydrate. Does that, does that answer it? <laughs> I, I think it does. And I think that there were a lot of other kind of questions about um, drinks that on, on the market that have a lot of sugar. And so I think that you really address that. That's an important aspect. And, and I think it's also important to, to consider when to use sports drinks. So mm -hmm. thank you. Quickly, people want to like jump to protein, but protein's not going to do much for you in, in the moment, in sport. It's going to take a lot more to break down. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Caroline, there are a number of questions for you. Um, and, and I think um, there are a few that are on this theme of recommendations for explaining celiac disease to your coaches uh, to see if, if they can get it. So, so um, parents don't want to see their children as, as a problem. They don't want to be overly aggressive, but of course they need to be safe. Um, and so how do you advocate for yourself without seeming like a, like a, like a bother or a nuisance and, and, and asking for, for gluten-free food when, when you're an athlete in, in high school or, or college? So that was actually something that was really hard for me to not seem like a bother um, or like a nuisance because I'm someone who always wants to like accommodate others and help others and I don't like to feel like I'm a problem. But what you have to remember is that you're not picky. Gluten-free food isn't a want. It's not something that like... I don't eat carrots on Tuesdays. Like, it's not like a picky, like, demand. Like, it's something you need to be safe and healthy. And most people, like, are not bad people. Like, most people, you're not going to say, like, gluten will make me violently ill. And they'll be like, we'll have bread. Most people aren't like that. Most people want to help. So I think when you're talking to a coach or when you're talking to a teammate um, and explaining what your needs are, I would just be straightforward and be like, I have celiac disease. I can't have gluten. I will get really sick if I have gluten. Um, what can we do on this trip? What can we do on this blank banquet? What can I bring? What will be there? And just like work it out as like a practical and logical plan. Because what you have to keep in mind is that you're not a problem. You're not a nuisance. You're not a burden. This is something you need to, in order to be healthy and safe. Yeah, and staying safe really should be the number one priority. So you do need to advocate for yourself. Um, so it's great to hear that that you've been able to do that. Um, and there are times, there's a question that, that came in uh, about someone who was, for whatever circumstance, whatever reason, was not able to stay safe and was glutened um, before their race. So um, that's one issue that may have come up for you. And so any suggestions on how to best recover from that type of situation? And um, I think related to that, uh, maybe kind of what you like to eat bef on race day or, or before events, um, one, to keep yourself safe, but also to, uh, to, to, to have that pre-race meal in you. Okay, so for the first part of that question with getting gluten before a race, as I said, I generally don't, like I make all my own food and I eat kind of like similar things before each race because that's something I'm paranoid about and I don't want to get gluten. And about recovering quickly before a race, I don't, like, I get really sick. Like, if I got gluten, I would not be racing the next day. Um, so I would say, like, don't do anything that will, like, hurt your body more. And if that means, like, missing a race, that might mean missing a race or missing a game, even though that's super duper disappointing and really unfortunate, especially if you've, like, traveled there and now you're stuck there and you're sick. But, like, you should like respect your body's needs and not like do something that will hurt it more. 
And then when it comes to eating, like on a race day, I'm very like ritualistic with it. I like to eat kind of the same thing. I always have the night before either chicken or salmon with um, broccoli, sweet potato, and a little bit of brown rice mixed in with that. And I mix it all together and I have that. And then morning of, if I'm racing like earlier in the day, and this is like the last thing I'm eating before I run, I'll probably have oatmeal with banana and some butter. But if I'm racing later in the day, I always have an English muffin with one egg and raspberries or a clementine. I just said lunch, but you're making me hungry. And I think that these are all great. Uh, this is great advice um, that my own family has also taken. Don't do anything new or different. Plan ahead. Um, my kids get sick when they get gluten as well. So um, the night before a really important event, they didn't do anything they didn't know for sure wasn't gluten-free. And it sounds like you follow that same advice and, and are pretty ritualistic. Um, one other question that's really specific for you, Caroline, and I think you're closest to this. So that's why I'm throwing this question at you. Um, but uh, there was someone who sent in a question about wanting to know some specifics for teenage girls. Um, how, what are some issues or thoughts and how do you address the intersection between development, puberty, um, sports and celiac disease. And I know it's a pretty broad question, um, but it, it, is there something specific that you can think of that came up with or that um, you talked about as a family or with your medical team? So I know something that came up a lot for me was I didn't get my period until like later than I should have. And then I just didn't get it at all after it for like months. And it, it's just been like an ongoing issue. And I was told by like just people in general and like medical professionals, that's normal. It's because you're healthy and fit and you work out a lot and you run. It's not normal. <laughs> um, and I think that people say this to even girls who don't have celiac disease that like that means you're fit. That means you're running a lot. That means you're health. That is not a set. That's like your body like breaking down. Like that's not healthy. So that would be like the number one thing. I would say that if you're like a teenage girl who's losing your period and working out whether or not you have celiac disease, that's a problem. Like something's wrong and it like needs to be addressed. And like, I let this go on and on, like on and off for years because it was normal because I was like fit and healthy and running and it meant I was like in good shape, but like, that's not right. <laughs> and I feel like that's told to a lot of teenage girls. So I'd say that's like the number one thing. And the other thing I will say is with the intersection of celiac disease and like sport and like going through puberty is when you go through puberty, your body like looks different and it changes and most people gain a little bit of weight and that's normal and fine. And when you get diagnosed with celiac disease, a lot of people are malnourished and they also gain a little bit of weight. And I know for me at that time, like I was like, I should be like still as skinny as I was then, but like, that's not true. And I feel like in sports, especially in my sport of distance running, it's promoted that like skinnier is better. But like I was skinny because I was really skinny because I was malnourished because I wasn't absorbing nutrients. And I feel like that's a narrative that can definitely like mess with, especially people with celiac disease's head. Because if you look back in a picture that you were like really skinny and you're like, oh, I was so skinny there. But like that's, you were skinny because you're malnourished. And like in sports, that's something's promoted that like smaller is better. But for people with celiac disease, a lot of us were smaller because we were really, really sick and not absorbing essential nutrients. And that's also something I feel like to keep in mind. Aaron, I just want to say that was amazing. I'm going to interrupt you, Sam. I'm sorry. Um, I think you just gave some really great practical advice. And I think that that all goes back to sometimes this number doesn't mean anything, right? And so I think that we have to look at the whole picture of what someone is doing. And if you see a change, if you see something that's different than what it was, I think that's a really important piece. Um, and it also just speaks to how well you were advocating for yourself that you were figuring it out. And so I think sometimes, um, you know, groups like this are really helpful with helping people feel that they can connect with someone and then keep pushing for, and advocating for yourself. I need to jump into it. Tara, you beat me to it. Caroline, that was incredible. That was incredible. Just to hear it from your lens and everything you said was absolutely true. You know, the sort of acceptance of amenorrhea needs to go away. It is not okay. It is definitely the body's way of telling us that, that we are in relative energy deficiency. 
Um, and just, I, I really echo everything. Um, you're, you're inspiring. Your story and sort of your understanding of all of it is incredible. Thank you so much. And there are comments coming in that also have the same sentiment, just to talking about thanking you for sharing your story and saying that you're brave. I think we all uh, feel the, the same way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, there are a number of questions on bone and muscle. Uh, turning to something totally different. Uh, and so, um, Tara, maybe we can start with you since you were talking about this and it's somewhat related to calcium and, and vitamin D. Uh, but there are a, a couple of, of questions around osteoporosis and osteopenia. So if you've been diagnosed with celiac disease and osteoporosis, what are some foods? And I think you may have covered this already, um, or perhaps supplements uh, with athletes, a young athlete in osteopenia. And, and perhaps you can talk about that in specifically in the young uh, or younger than people should be in terms of getting osteopenia and osteoporosis. And on top of that, just to throw that, um, cause I know that you've covered a lot of it. So you'll summarize what you've talked about, but someone brought up the supplement alpha ketoglutarate, which I'm not familiar with, um, but uh, hopefully you are and can address whether that might be able to, to address some issues related to osteoporosis. Sure. So I just want to clarify first that I am a dietitian and I am not a doctor. And so I will give you advice on nutrition. I will not give any advice on anything that should be um, from a doctor. So it's really, really important differentiation. Um, of course, I always want to fix everything with diet because I am a dietitian. <laughs> However, we, there is a place for supplementation and there is a place for using other team members to help with this. I, I looked at that supplement. I, I don't know what that is to, I think it even said to cure reverse osteoporosis. And so I, I, I can't speak to that at all. And so I won't, um, I will say that the, the piece that I can, um, educate people on is to look at your diet and really look at it to see what you're taking in daily. That, that average of every three days of just kind of looking at it for a small window can kind of help and guide to what the next step might be. So it's important, and I always say too, as a younger person, I kind of tell my young patients of like, we have our bones and we can kind of fill them up, which is much, much calcium and vitamin D as we can up to a point. And, and so that's really important as a young person to make sure that you lay the foundation for the healthy bones to have your, to meet your needs throughout. After your bones are developed, it's still important to meet your needs because you don't want to leach or take away from the calcium in your bones because your body will do that because it needs it. So your body is an amazing thing and it will get what it wants. Um, but what you want to do is you want to keep your bones as healthy as possible. So growing up through the years, we want them to be firm and we want to feed them as much as possible. And then as we get older and I'm in that category now, um, we want to make sure that we get enough so that our, um, so we don't take it out of our bones to use for our other functions in our body. So looking at your diet and then in, in some cases, the need for supplementation and then as well as getting your doctor involved with this, whether it be a bone density exam, whether it be a vitamin D check, whether it be, you know, other things, I think that there are, are this is a, a, a multidisciplinary um, approach to this. Great. And Mary Ellen, um, let me uh, throw a couple of questions that have come in uh, related to um, athletes, in particular elite athletes. Um, that are related. One is, uh, do celi does celiac make you weaker as an elite athlete or, or stronger? And I think the sentiment really is that there are many uh, people in the public realm that are going gluten-free for their, what, what they see as, as for their health or their performance. Um, and, um, but then the person notes that there's this contrast that celiac is a disease. So some people are going gluten-free, um, not because they have celiac disease, but because they feel it enhances their performance. So let me start off with, with uh, having you address that question. Sure. So, so the, those who choose to go gluten-free and they don't need to, um, that that's actually very common. I would say, um, at the college level. So I work a lot in collegiate sports nutrition and sort of just a time where, um, I think at stage of development, folks start to kind of come into their own and have their own decisions about food, right? Like they're no longer living at home. So now they're in the dining hall or they have kitchens and they get to make these choices. And um, our job as a dietitian is to help them navigate if they make that choice. 
So what I have reminded folks who go gluten-free is that there are a lot of confounding factors when they eliminate gluten. So an example I will give you is an athlete of mine went gluten-free and felt great, but his diet prior to going gluten-free was beer and pizza and bagels and like, you know, all the things that like donuts for breakfast. So was it that he went gluten-free or was that it, that he became a much more mindful and intentional eater because he went from this college student athlete, stereotypical diet to like, you know, um, breakfast, homemade breakfast potatoes with peppers and onions and an egg. And now his lunch was this beautiful salad with quinoa and dinner was salmon and asparagus, you know, like all of a sudden this attention to his diet to me was the confounding factor. It had nothing to do with gluten. It was overall diet quality. And I believe that even if gluten was in that type of a well-planned diet, he would have felt fantastic. So I, I like to sort of tease through those things. Um, and to the other question that you're asking, so the initial question was, do does a gluten-free diet, you know, make them a weaker athlete or a stronger athlete? I think it all ties it. It's the overall diet quality of, of the way that an, a person chooses to fuel their body. So someone can be gluten-free. And as Tara said, just sort of like gluten-free pretzels, gluten-free this, gluten-free that, and like no balance, no color, no produce, you know, not emphasizing high quality proteins. So it's not really the piece of the gluten-free diet. It's the overall diet quality that's going to decide if the athlete is, is, you know, fueling appropriately. Can I add one thing? Because I think that it, it's, it's um, you hit it all out of the park, but I think that the, the only positive thing I tell people when they're diagnosed with celiac disease is sometimes their diet gets much better because they can't eat all of the other foods that, that some people do live on. And so that's the only tweak that sometimes is a very positive note um, that they have, sure. a really, they have a better diet. And yes, I agree. Thank you. Great examples. Thank you. Um, and, and Mary Ellen, I think I want to stick with you just in terms of uh, more of the, the collegiate or, or elite level kind of supplements that, that people may have. There, there are a lot of questions about injuries and what to, what to do about that. So um, first of all, do people with celiac have uh, a higher tendency for injuries? Um, and if they do, are they slower to heal? And what can be done to either prevent it or help healing? There's questions about protein supplements or collagen, um, other types of supplements. So, so what do you see and, and what do you recommend in those situations? Sure. So um, I think like everything in nutrition, it depends, right? So we're, it depends on what type of injury are we talking about? Is it an overuse injury? Is it an acute injury? Are we looking at concussions? Are we looking at bone injury, bone injuries? Are we looking at, you know, ligament issues? So so many variabilities about like what are going to be the primary primary things we're focused on. So a bone issue, we're definitely going to want to pay attention to bone. And as Tara had mentioned, we ultimately want those, those blood markers first. So we're not just throwing vitamin D at a bone issue. If we don't know that they actually have, you know, low vitamin D, we're paying attention to that. Um, you know, with muscle issues, if, if somebody has a long, um, a long recovery that they're going to be sidelined for a while, we are going to probably start to see muscle atrophy. And so there may be some dietary supplements that we may pay attention to. Dietary supplements are only going to be effective in the presence of an adequate diet. So I always say if we're just, that's why it's at the top of my pyramid, right? So if we're spending a lot of money on these supplements, but we're not eating adequately and we're not balancing out what we're consuming, we're probably throwing our money away. Um, and then within the dietary supplement class, there's actually very few things on the market that really have science behind them. Um, so some of these vitamins and minerals, um, depending on, on what we're trying to do. So the vitamin D and calcium and, you know, iron, some of these things may make sense. Um, a standard multivitamin might make sense as so a gluten-free multivitamin, just to sort of round somebody out. Um, and then other areas of dietary supplements, like you mentioned, Protein powders. So there's a wide variety of protein powders. I mean, it's like, do we need them? No, we can probably meet our protein needs through food, most people, but they are a convenient way to get protein into the diet for somebody, you know, that needs it. So maybe they're not a breakfast eater, but they're willing to have a smoothie in the morning. I would love to see the smoothie probably have some sort of protein. So whether it's yogurt or an, uh, a whey protein, or it could be a plant-based protein, there's a time and a place for these products. But I would always go back to the slide that I had put up is 
you had mentioned, this is for college student athletes. Um, they can be randomly drug tested at any time. And so individuals who work with college student athletes um, or post-college, we're very careful about the brands that we are recommending because we want to make sure that they're third-party tested, specifically that NSF certification, because in this country, that is the best we have. We have that third-party testing that can tell us there's a 99.9% .9 chance that there will be no banned substances and that what it says on the label is what is actually in there. Great. And we're running short on time, but I think that we should finish with one question uh, that's, that's a more general question related to celiac disease, which I know many families struggle with. And, and that is uh, this question that, that asks uh, about a household that's 100% gluten-free for one or more people in the house that are celiac disease. And the question is whether that's gonna negatively impact other people in the house. Because if you don't have celiac disease, should you be on a gluten-free diet? Um, if you're at risk for getting uh, celiac disease, should you be on a gluten-free diet? So um, I think that this is uh, an important question that, that we should address before we wrap up. So I say to, uh, we have lots of families who have both people um, with celiac disease and not celiac disease in families. I think it's really important to keep gluten in the child's diet that does not is not diagnosed with celiac disease. However, it does not need to take over the household. And so the way that I explain it sometimes is, especially if the age of the kids is very important too, because you don't want the younger child with celiac disease to take their food and things like that. So the way that I describe it is that when you're outside of the house, the person without celiac disease can eat gluten. And then when you are in the house, then you don't eat gluten, but it could be as easy as that there are five lunch boxes, like I pack in the morning and, you know, three have gluten-free foods and two have gluten containing foods and they might be in individual packages. So there's no cross contact. And so it's really outside of the family. I think it's also important that both sides in your family understand the importance of the other one. And so the person who has celiac disease is going to be in many situations where they have to navigate food that has gluten in it. Um, and the other sense is that we also, we wanna teach the child or the person without celiac disease um, how those foods are, how they taste and to not limit anything you have to. For, for all pediatrics, I wanna have the biggest variety we possibly can. When you have celiac disease, you're already having to eliminate some foods However, I don't expect people to make two different dinners and two different breakfasts and things like that. So the house is going to be, it sounds like, you know, gluten-free, but then for the child or the person without celiac disease, I encourage them to eat gluten outside of the house. Great. Caroline, what'd you do in your house? Um, so both my parents do not have celiac disease. I'm an only child and I'm the only one in my house who cannot eat gluten or really has any dietary restrictions. Um, so in our house, we like for dinners and stuff, we eat even prior. I think part of the reason it took me so long to get diagnosed with celiac disease is like, we don't eat a ton. Of, we're not like big, like bread people. Um, we're not like we have pasta sometimes, um, but we mostly have stuff like rice quinoa um potatoes free. squash we all like stuff like that and i don't know what they do alumni not here at college maybe it's like <laughs> a gluten party for like the last six months to live it away i'm not really sure what they do um they could be having like cake every night who knows but <laughs> um like we don't have a toaster so we just kind of toast everything in the oven on tin foil um they have a separate loaf of gluten containing bread but most of our meals just kind of always have been naturally gluten-free so they continue to be naturally gluten-free um and the only difference is is like we have like labeled like olivios and other spreads aren't an issue because i can't have nuts so i'm not going to be eating their peanut butter anyways and um, the only other thing is a lot of we have like different sauces and stuff because I can't have garlic and onion because of SIBO. So that's kind of the only it's honestly the other dietary restrictions that we have like that's separate more. things for yeah. um, not as much gluten. But yeah, they have their own loaf of bread and that's kind of it. Well, thank you. And um, we're, we're out of time. So I just um, before I turn it over back to Lee Graham, I should say uh, I want to thank all of our speakers, Tara, Mary Ellen, Caroline, thank you for your insights, for your presentations, for your thoughts. We really appreciate it. And um, thank you, everyone else for your time today. And I'll turn it back to you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Sam.
We hope all of you found this webinar as interesting as I did. I learned something new every time. It was wonderful. And we'll uh, again be hosting webinars in the fall. So check the NCA website for further information probably later this summer. And until then, from all of us here, see you next time and stay well.